how big can you take these businesses are we talking i've got three different amazon businesses they do about two hundred fifty thousand dollars a month and the cool thing about these businesses is that they're sellable two years ago and we did about 16 and a half million dollars mm -hmm. we've done 10x in one year our three-year target is 80 million dollars a year that's in 2026 from 2015 to 2020 i launched a total of nine businesses wow. the first seven failed where i am right now is in the last three four years we've done about 35 million dollars online what happens is you see someone succeed, but you only know about them after they become successful. What was the tipping point for you to go from a failing business to something that actually worked for you? It was experience. Regardless what it is I'm trying to accomplish, someone else has done it before me. And so instead of trying to you know, figure it out through trial and error, why not learn from them? In my mind, I'm like, if I can and make money at the same place, it's like, holy shit. With that said, I always had an entrepreneurial spirit because my dad was actually a successful entrepreneur in Iraq. He owned the second largest clothing factory in Iraq in the 80s and early 90s. 2015, 2016, and 2017 were probably the worst year that I've ever had in my life. What we do is in the morning, we will go and we will drop off the inventory. On the way back to my car, five cops just like surround me and he's like, Bashar? I was like, yes, you're being served. But it's like, that was my life. A lot of people will wait for the perfect conditions. Those don't exist. A lot of people will wait to make $10,000 to go invest it. Look, how long has it taken you to make the last $10,000 you had? Maybe never. I realized this myself. I went from having a million dollar business in 2018 at 25 years old to losing everything. And a year later after that point, working as a cashier in a gas station here in Miami and then building from that. It took me a year and a half to get out of that situation and then rebuild back up. Your own mind plays limitations and your environment dictates a lot of what you think is real. Welcome to another episode of Millionaire Attitude. Today we have somebody that has built an eight figure business after his local business completely burnt to the ground. Thank you so much for being here, man. Mr. Bashar. Thanks for having me. And um, you have been become iconic on the Instagram space when it comes to shout outs and all that, all that realm. Sure. And um, your signature. It's the mustache. The right? mustache. Yeah, yeah. The mustache, man. I can't grow a mustache to save my <laughs> life. I really can't. <laughs> so I'm somewhat jealous. I appreciate you being here, man. Appreciate <laughs> you for having me. So for those that don't know you, who's Bashar? What do you do today? And we'll start from there. So right at the at this moment, I'm an Amazon investor and um, I coach people on how to start Amazon businesses online, how to get it off the ground, start making money within three to six months. Nice. Yeah. Nice. And then the Amazon business or Amazon investing business that you have and then you have an education company, correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. So what tell us a little bit what kind of um, revenue for people that are wondering how big can you take these businesses are we talking? Um, well, I mean, I'll tell you some numbers from our own place. So I've got three different Amazon businesses. They do about $250,000 a month. Um, wow. And uh, the cool thing about these businesses is that they're sellable. So you could actually, it's an asset that you can exit. Mm -hmm. um, and right now we're looking at exiting uh, two of the three in the next 12 to 18 months. And uh, normally you can get anywhere between four to eight X EBITDA. So, you know, those that are watching that maybe don't know what EBITDA is, just think about it as your net profit, you know, kind of sh short for that. Uh, so take that for the last 12 months and then multiply that by four to eight. And that's what you can get for something like this. That's been running for at least a couple of years. That's got at least a net profit of about 20%. Nice. Yep. Nice. That's awesome. And then the education company, yes. which is obviously the, 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 how I came to know you. Yes. What kind of like numbers are you pulling or like pushing on that side? Cause it's huge. Um, our biggest year was, uh, two years ago and we did about 16 and a half million dollars. Uh, we're, uh, targeting to do. So this is, this might sound crazy, but uh, mm -hmm. we've done uh, 10X in, in one year. So I think we can do it again. Um, our three-year target is $80 million a year. Uh, that's in 2026. Um, and that's kind of my main focus where nice. I spend probably about 90% of my time right now. Cool. Yeah. I love it. I love it. So obviously for you, this started, I mean, you 10X in a single year and now you want 10X again, right? But obviously you don't start in that level when you're starting a business. What was Bashar before when you were trying to build this entire um, portfolio of different companies that you have today? So I started my journey probably at the age of uh, 20 years old, uh, okay. 19, 20 years old. Um, my family and I had our first uh, uh, business in America because we were uh, immigrants to the U.S. Uh, back in 2006. You're, you're, where are you from originally? Iraq. Iraq. Yeah. Okay. Um, after the war in 2003, uh, we migrated to, to America. 
And um, about five years into it, we finally, you know, accomplished the American dream, right? We had our own business. Um, and uh, and that did, you know that actually was doing well. It was a, a local uh, a local pizzeria mm -hmm. uh, where my family and I ran it. I worked for the first time in my life, working 80 hours a week, seven days a week, no days off. Um, and that's when it started, right? And then a couple of years into it, I realized that I wanted to branch out and do something, you know, um, of my own and something kind of bigger than what the family was envisioning for themselves. Uh, and that's when I started a restaurant back in 2013. And fortunately, that place, uh, you know, uh, crash and burn. We can go into the story if you yeah. want later down the line uh, in 2015. And then from 2015 to 2019, 2020, I launched a total of nine businesses. Wow. The first seven failed. So where I am right now is in the last three, four years, we've done about $35 million online. And that is after nine businesses, seven of which failed in over about 12, 13 years of trying to become a successful entrepreneur. Hmm. And so those that are watching, um, oftentimes what happens is you see someone succeed, but you only know about them after they become successful. Correct. And people say, well, it's an, an overnight success. Well, it's not. You only found out about them after they became successful, but you haven't seen the, the trials and tribulations that took years and decades for them to get to the point where you finally knew about them. Correct. So what, what do you think happened in those seven businesses that failed initially? What was the tipping point for you to go from a failing business to something that actually worked for you? I think it had to happen for me to get here. It was experience, um, not having experience. Uh, mm. If I boil it down to that and trying to do everything by myself. And so after seven businesses, it's like, you know, the first time, the second time, third time, it's like you, you kind of need to learn after a few times. It took me seven times. What I realized is that regardless what it is I'm trying to accomplish, someone else has done it before me. And many people have done it before me. And so instead of trying to, you know, figure it out through trial and error, why not learn from them? And that's essentially what I implemented in business eight, which is why I succeeded. And in business nine, which is why I succeeded, because right off the get go, I just found someone that I could resonate with that I know have the kind of success that I want, follow their footsteps. Okay. So for you, basically what you're saying is one of the biggest key things that you didn't do in the seven business that you failed was you didn't hire somebody to show you the ropes. I did it by myself. I did it on my own, try to figure it out by myself. And what were the seven businesses? Like what, what were some of them? Two of them were restaurants. Okay. Um, uh, so, so one burnt, you burnt a restaurant and then you try to build two more. Right. Well, one more, you know, okay. so one, okay. one, two were two were restaurants. Uh, a couple of them were actually online, online businesses as well. Three of them were medical marijuana dispensaries, believe it or not. So I've been involved in the, uh, you know, illegal, uh, you know, kind of a, was a drug dealer at some point uh, back in uh, San Diego because that's where I lived for 14 yeah. years before moving to Miami. Uh, it was the green rush in San Diego uh, between the years of 2010, 2012 to about 2017, 2018. And so right after my restaurant burned down, me and a friend borrowed money and we put together $15,000 between the two of us and um, and opened a medical marijuana dispensary. I, I had never smoked weed in my life, <laughs> you know? Um, a bunch of our friends had marijuana dispensaries and you know some of these guys were pulling 10 20 30 thousand dollars a day wow in sales and so i'm like all right we gotta do it two weeks into our first one we get raided by the because th these are technically illegal but you're kind of running under the radar it's like uh it's federally illegal it's state legal there it's like gray area yeah, yeah, you know yeah. So we get raided by the, the 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 police two weeks into it. They take everything and the $15,000 we had invested, it's all gone. I had a DUI about, I had gotten a DUI about a year before and I, and I, I was on probation and I shouldn't be around anywhere that is, you know, that yeah, yeah. conducts illegal activity. Luckily, they didn't take, you know, they didn't arrest me, but they, you know, confiscated everything. Uh, but we didn't stop. Uh, you know, we're not quitters. So we went and borrowed more money and then restarted. And uh, after that, uh, launched two more uh, dispensaries. Um, we made a little money, but we lost all of it because it was like you take the money here, you put it in the next place, the next place gets raided, and it was just like that cycle. <laughs> and we were never able to really make the kind of money that we should have made from that kind of business. I've had many friends that made millions of dollars from it. Unfortunately, it wasn't us. Got it. But why do you think then for you guys it didn't work? Like, do you think the other people, like the competitor down the street was like, hey, there's, there's a dispensary over there that's illegal, and then they like like snitch on you? Um, <laughs> you know, there's probably some of that. Um, but really it was the same thing, man. 
looking back at it, everyone, you know, neither me or my friend or my partner had experience in running a business. And it was a business, that's all it is. Mm -hmm. And we try to try to figure it out all by ourselves. Where all of our friends who made money either were, you know, uh, serial entrepreneurs that had, you know, I'm Chaldean, I'm originally from Iraq, we're Catholics of Iraq, there's a small community of us in San Diego and Arizona and, and Detroit. And so a lot of us are known for owning gas stations, liquor stores, smoke shops. And a lot of these guys, either their their family owned businesses, their relatives, or they partnered up with someone who had the experience, business experience, right? Neither of us had operated a successful business. And it was just kind of like, Johnny's doing it, we can do it as well. Mm. You know, we've got a couple of vendors that can, you know, uh, provide us some flour and stuff like that. It's like, all right, well, we're gonna go and kind of start it. Got it. Um, and it didn't work, you know, mm. because of that. Got it, okay. And then, so let, let's go back, because I, I wanna like hear the story. I know it, but I think it's like super interesting how you, your family had a pizzeria. You decided yes. to branch off on your own to start your own restaurant business. Yes. And that didn't work. What happened and why did it burn down in the first place when your family had a successful restaurant, right? Yeah, so I mean, it didn't burn down because it was unsuccessful. Okay. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but it was unsuccessful though. It's been two years, we're in the family business. I want to go 150 miles an hour. They want to go, you know, three and a half miles an hour. What, what was it like? What, what does that mean? Just like, so I understand, like, what does that mean? Because I, I somewhat get it, but somewhat don't. In the pizzeria, I don't know, like, the context. Like, what does it mean to go 150 miles an hour to scale a pizzeria business? What does that look like versus slowing down and taking it more chill? Sure. So when we started, my brother was the, uh, the kind of the, the boss. Mm -hmm. um, so it was me, my brother, my mom and dad. My mom was 60. Two, my dad was 74. Um, so they're, you know, they're elderly. Mm -hmm. They were helping us prep in the morning. They're in the kitchen prepping, cutting tomatoes, onions, all that stuff, uh, shopping for us, all that. And me and my brother are running the actual day-to-day -day delivery, all that stuff. And then we hired one of his best friends to help us. Um, so my brother is the one that call, you know, that calls the shots. In my mind, let's go and buy five other pizzerias. We can raise money. We can take our profits. Let's raise some more money. Let's buy five or six pizzerias. Let's create a concept amongst all of them. Let's remodel, come up with a name, and then start franchising, hmm. right? So that I'm, uh, that's what I'm thinking, right? I'm yeah. thinking like a, you know, a nine-figure business, maybe even a billion-dollar business down the line, right? My brother's like, yeah, maybe we'll buy a second place in three years, and then we'll maybe buy another one like two, three years after that, and let's just make sure that we get it right and stuff like that, right? Now, he's, at the time, he's about 30, I don't know, 32, 33. Uh, we're nine years apart. I'm 22 at the time. And so, again, he's he just d didn't have the same drive that I had hmm. um, and wasn't in the same um, uh, chapter in his life that I was in. I'm a 20-year-old kid that just wants to go, and he's more kind of chill and mellow and that kind of stuff, you know? So that's really where the break happened. And we used to have a lot of, a lot of problems between us because I want to do all these things and you want to take it very slow. And again, he's the one calling the shots. Yeah. My parents just want a stable business that's generating money. And you know, it was, we were doing about, I don't know, like six, seven grand a month in profits, which was cool, man, for a family. You know, we have, we're living in an apartment, got a couple of cars, like we were doing pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Five years after migrating to a country where we knew nothing about, like we were living the American dream, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 got it, okay. And then you decide to branch off completely to create your own restaurant was it also a pizzeria um no it started as uh, uh american food just burgers and stuff like that um and uh was just like a, a restaurant bar dive bar pretty much um but it, it had a, a a big space was about 3500 square feet you know big uh big uh patios uh big parking spaces and stuff like that and my thought process was now imagine this so i'm a 23 year old kid who's been partying seven days a week for the last four years since i was 18 19 to about 22 23 <laughs> I go out seven days a week. How, how? How are you running a pizzeria and doing that? Literally, <laughs> I, I get home at four or five o'clock in the morning. I go to sleep. I wake up at 8.39, go to work. By the time it's 11 o'clock, by the time I'm like sober, I start messaging my friends. I'm like, all right, what are we doing tonight? You know? <laughs> and then we're planning until about six, seven, and we go out and that was literally seven days a week. In my mind, I'm like, if I can and make money at the same place, it's like, holy shit, this is a great combination, right? <laughs> yeah. No one watching right now should ever want to do that because you never want to do that. You just don't mix the two. With that said, I always had an entrepreneurial spirit because my dad was actually a successful entrepreneur in Iraq. He owned the second largest clothing factory in Iraq in the 80s and early 90s. And I had watched him as I was growing up 
being someone that was, uh, you know, uh, very, you know, looked up to in the community, a mover, a shaker. People looked up to him. People came to him for advice. And fortunately, his businesses uh, crashed. And uh, especially after the, the invasion in 2003 on Iraq, he lost everything and just was never able to recover. But I always, like, I admired him and I wanted to be like him, right? My mom tried to sell me on the idea of I should go to school, get a degree, because entrepreneur, you know, yeah. entrepreneurship is not, uh, it's risky. Look at what happened with your dad. But I always knew I wanted to become an entrepreneur. And that's why I was like, I have to make this happen. And that's why I went on on my, you know, by myself. And how do you start a restaurant business back then? What happened when it burned down? Well, why I'll, did it burn down? I'll tell you how you don't start it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> because that's what I did. So the way that you don't start a restaurant business is by watching John Taffer's Bar Rescue reality TV show and take notes thinking that six months into it, you've got everything you need to start and scale a successful restaurant business. <laughs> that's not how you do it. Cause that's what I did. I would literally watch a, an hour of TV reality show and take notes like I'm st like I'm in a, in a mastermind like, or I'm like taking a course, course or something. Like, like, literally, like literally, you know, hmm. and uh, I got excited about it. You know, uh, uh, obviously I only saw what they wanted to see. I didn't see the back of the house. I didn't see, you know, budgets and all that stuff, the yeah. real business part of it. So I took what I saw on that on the show and then tried to implement it here. Um, I still believe that the vision for the place was uh, was pretty cool, actually. Hmm. So my whole thing was, uh, and this is super cool, uh, my whole thing was, um, it was a country town. I was raised with a father who literally, until this day, if you go to our house, my parents' house, you will see him watching old country western movies. You know, uh, 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 John Wayne and all these guys, you know? Yeah, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Exactly. <laughs> Clint Eastwood, all these guys. Yeah. So I literally was raised with that. And so coming to America and stuff like that, it was like in my blood kind of thing, you know? A country town, I was like, this is perfect. The rodeo was right across the street. I was like, what I want to do is I want to bring the old rustic feel and I want to kind of bring it back to the, to the kind of like to the modernize it almost, you know? Because I was, I was partying at all these like brand new places with all these new colors and new concepts, but I also had that old rustic, thing in me yeah. you know so i wanted to combine the two the way that i wanted to cross that was through uh back to the future so i was i was going to use that concept we called the place the bucking delorean the bucking delorean like so a we, car right so we had a uh mechanical bull and the mechanical bull was going to have a the, the back of the, the the delorean tied up to it and then we were going to kind of become like a like a futuristic old type of place or whatever <laughs> we literally had deloreans three deloreans out front for the grand opening it was such a cool con again the concept was very cool the i needed an operator yeah i needed someone i was the visionary i needed someone that understood how to operate a successful restaurant and that's what i mean by trying to do it by myself because i had the vision instead of having such a big ego like i did and thinking that i can do it all by myself what i should have done was either learned how to do it correctly or partnered up with someone that, a great restaurant manager, someone that understands how to manage mm -hmm. a business successfully. And I believe we would have actually made a, a success out of that place. Got it, mm -hmm. got it. And then it burns down. Did the DeLoreans burn down? Burn down? Um, <laughs> so about two months before the DeLorean burned down, um, <laughs> we actually had changed the concept because I finally, for the first time in my life, I had allowed a consultant or someone to consult me. Hmm. I had allowed someone to tell me that I was wrong and I didn't know what I was doing and that here's how to do it correctly. And that's the problem that I see with a lot of people now is that not only do they not know what to do, but they don't allow other people to show them how to do it because in their mind, if that person can do it, I can do it. And I got to tell you, this is far from the truth. And it's literally the worst position you can be in. The minute you think you know it all, it's the minute that everything is going to be in a decline. Yep. Because I've been through that many times in my life. In fact, 12 months ago, I was for about six months of my life. I thought I was the shit. I thought I had made it and I just was not receptive to any new information. So two months prior to the fire, we actually had changed the concept because the previous concept didn't work. Uh, we changed the concept to pizzeria, to what I knew how to do. Yeah and actually re, uh, increased our sales by 47% in the, in the first 30 days. And we're gonna triple that in the next 60 days. But on April 28, 2015, it was a Tuesday. I was leaving uh, the restaurant, it was around five o'clock to go pick up my girlfriend, who's not my wife. I got a call from John, the bartender. 
And John's like, uh, hey boss, you gotta come back. The kitchen's on fire. And I was like, okay, put it out. How bad is it? He's like, no, 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 you don't understand. Everyone's outside. Firefighters are inside. You need to be here. By the time I get back, there's about seven, eight fire engines outside. And uh, my landlord, Steve, is, uh, is outside. And he's like to me, well, hey man, you know, by the way, I haven't paid Steve for about four months now. I'm like late on rent. He's like, well, hey, look, I get it, you know. Insurance really good at these things. They'll take care of it for you. Now look at Steve and I'm like, well, here's the problem, Steve. I haven't paid insurance in six months. And he's like, why the fuck haven't you done that? Why did you do that? <laughs> After two and a half years of running a unsuccessful restaurant with yeah. a $1,500 a month insurance bill, you think to yourself, what's the worst gonna happen? I can take that money, put it somewhere else. Hmm. You know? Um, again, not knowing what the hell I was doing. What did Steve tell you at that time? Like what happened after the fact? Like, why the hell didn't you pay insurance? Now what happens after? Place is burnt down. You have no insurance. There's no way to like the company to, you know, come back after that. What did Steve tell you? Well, Steve ended up suing me uh, and kicking me out because I was uh, about two and a half years into my five year lease. So he ended up suing me for the rest. Uh, we worked out, you know, worked something out. He was a uh, it was cool after all and kind of worked it out. but. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, it was a time of reflection. Uh, hmm. I went into depression. That's actually where the mustache came from, believe it or not. Really? Hmm. The mustache is a result of being about 150K in debt, losing everything, hitting rock bottom, getting a DUI six months later, um, and then growing a big old beard that's down to here. And then when I was kind of coming out of depression and all that, I was like, all right, I'm time to shave. And I was always influenced by uh, Egyptian soap operas as a little kid watching with my mom and sister. Uh, and there was this uh, community in Egypt, they had these big mustaches. And I was always influenced by that. I was, I always thought that was super cool. And now I had an opportunity to, you know, to grow a mustache. So I shaved it off. I think it was late 2015, early 2016. And since then I've had a mustache. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah. What, what, did, what did your girlfriend at the time think? What did she think when you were going through all this stuff? I mean, losing the business, burns down, gets a lawsuit, DUI. Yeah. Gets raided by the police on the next business. Yeah. Next, all seven businesses fail. Yeah. What was she thinking? Why do you think she stayed with you throughout the entire time? I, honestly, I, we joke we joke about it right now all the time. Uh, she goes, I saw potential. You know, <laughs> I knew there was potential. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why she stayed, to be honest with you. Um, Cause literally when, when we first met, it seemed like I had it all figured out. Hmm. I'm a, you know, 20, 25 year old kid, 24 at the time, 24, 24 year old kid with a business, you know, which from the outside looked like it was doing very well. Yeah. It's like, you don't see that many 24 year old kids with a restaurant that has 20, 30 employees and like, okay, this kid got it all figured out actually, you know? Hmm. So it looked like I had it all figured out. As a, uh, a female that is, you know, uh, uh, um, that is born with the mentality of, you know, find a good husband, get married, have kids and so on. And the culture that we have being Middle Eastern, I think that's a, a good mentality to have. It's like, OK, he's got it figured out and, you know, we're going to get married and stuff like that and I can live a good life. So I could see why she got with me then. Yeah. Now, why she stayed for the next because this is 20. So I lose the restaurant 2015. You're, you you started well you successful restaurant concept 24 years old it 24. burns down when you were well 23 years old 23. I took over September 20, uh, uh, 2013 and then it burns down April uh, 2015 okay so a year and a half later yeah more or less yeah almost two after that from then until about like 2019 for the wow. next like four years we're struggling dude like we are really struggling you know 2018 we get married. So it's like she stayed through the entire, like especially 2015, 2016, and 2017 were probably the worst year that I've ever had in my life, you know, because DUI, you know, a uh, uh, debt, uh, debt collectors, IR, you know, IRS, all that stuff. And then also getting into um, those businesses, like I was looking over my shoulder all day, every day. We were being followed and watched by the by the cops all the time, you know, because, because of the dispensaries, the dispensaries all the time. Like literally, I w we were joking about it the other day, actually, like two yesterday. One day I so I draw I uh, because I got to a point where I couldn't even be at the shop anymore because they were going to raid us at any moment and I didn't want to get arrested. So neither me or my partner go. We have employees that are working there. What we do is in the morning, we will go and we will, um, you know, we will uh, 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 drop off the, uh, the, the inventory and we yeah. will like like open and stuff like that on the way back to my car five cops just like like surround me and he's like Bashar 
He's like, yes, you're being served. And I'm like, why did you just have to do all this? He's like, oh, this is from the district attorney. She just wanted me to make sure that you, that you got delivered to you. Just like scare tactics, you know, and they mm. searched the car and stuff like that. Um, but it's like, that was my life. Every day I would open the cameras to look at the place and it's like, oh my God, please work, please work. And sometimes like the cameras would take like an extra two minutes to load. I'm like, oh shit, we got rid. Oh, no way. The shop is still there, you know? Oh that was every day, you know, for like, I don't know, for like a year and a half that we did that. So living through all that and then getting married to me, um, I don't know. I honestly don't know. You're going to have to ask her. Um, mm. Again, we joke about it. And if she says, uh, you know, I saw potential, but... Um, Interesting. What 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 did you do during that time to keep the relationship alive? Because, um, well, you heard all the stats, all the statistics, all the stuff um, where it's like, okay, 50% of the uh, marriages uh, fail. A lot of them are for financial issues, yes. right? Um, that time was very, very, I mean, very hard for you because you're going up, down, sideways. You don't know <laughs> police is involved, district attorney. I can only imagine the amount of stress you're having. How do you keep the relationship alive during that time as a man? Sam Ovens, which we both know, mm -hmm. um, I asked him once and I said, like, what is the role that your wife plays in your life? Because, you know, she's not like she's not an entrepreneur. She doesn't have a career. You know, at the time they didn't even have kids. He said every single person has two lives, especially an entrepreneur. We have our work life and then we have our home life. At any given time, only one of them can be chaotic. And if you want to succeed in your business, your home life has to be settled. You can't have turbulence in your home life because if you do, then you're gonna take energy and attention and focus away from your business and put it there and you can't do that. And so that's what my wife brings to the relationship. Now, what did I do is understanding that. And in the beginning, I demanded a lot from her more than that. Because in my mind, my father, my mom and dad, had they lived in a different country, they would have been divorced a long time ago. You know, my dad was the, 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 the you know, the uh, breadwinner. He went out and he made money and stuff like that. My mom was a stay home mom, but they always fought. They always had problems, you know, growing up, I wanted someone that was independent. I wanted a wife that had her own career, maybe involved in my business, kind of like Alex and, and, and Layla Harmozy, you know what I mean? And, uh, and for the first couple of years with, with together, I try to shape my wife to be that, but that's not her. Hmm. Until I realized that lesson from Sam Ovens. And so when you understand who that person is and you're not in the relationship just to take, but to give as well, that's when you can actually have a good marriage that will last. Because again, we, we've been together for nine years, going on 10 years. Actually, uh, uh, March 3rd is our anniversary, and we're nice. going to be six that's like, years married. That's next week. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, what I realized is our relationship has only gotten better over the years, regardless of what happens. And we don't really have like big fights. Like when we first got married the first couple of years, oh my God, I mean, we've talked about divorce probably like on a monthly basis. The first year especially, you know? But then as we go, we just continue to get better. And it's because we both understand that it's it's a team, it's a team effort. And I can't only expect, and I can't only take from the relationship. I need to be able to give and understand that we all have dreams, we all have fantasies, we all have all these kinds of crazy things, but everything comes with a sacrifice. What exactly are you looking for? What exactly is it that you're demanding? If you are, if you know the top three things that you want from a, a spouse or a partner, then everything else you need to be kind of flexible with. For me, it's love, it's uh, 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 support, and it's uh, uh, loyalty. As long as these three exist, I don't care about everything else. Mm. I can be flexible about everything else. But those three, they have to exist. The minute that these, th these three things kind of become unshakable, then that's when... I start questioning everything, but she always showed me that she will give me those three things, especially support, especially loyalty. You know, love is just like, it's one of those things that it's like, I don't even think about it. I know it's there, but it's like loyalty. Like the last thing you want is when you're at work thinking, yeah. is my wife fooling around? Like, you know, what is she doing? What, you know what I mean? Like, I don't want to be thinking then those kinds of things. And the other thing is support. For me, you know, my, my kind of like my love language is, is uh, 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 words of affirmation. Like I'm not the kind that, like let's say my my trainer at the gym, if he talks down at me, it actually demotivates me. Hmm. If he gives me kudos, that's what motivates me, right? And so for her, it's being that person that's like, you got it, man. No problem, yeah, go out there, You've, you, let's go, let's crush it, you know what I mean? Even though she doesn't know what the hell I do, 
you know? <laughs> yeah. But it's like just giving me those words of affirmations and understanding that these are the things that matter for me. And I think now a lot of men look for a lot from the spouse and they don't know what those two, three things that are really important to them are. Got it. Mm. Hmm. Interesting. That's pretty cool. Okay. So now let's transition into the current business that you have today. Burns down. I mean, you, you, you don't know why your wife's still with you throughout this entire <laughs> thing. You're like, saw potential. Um, but I mean, like, I can only imagine what she was thinking. That, oh, not again. Yeah, yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. But you guys go through that. And then a business starts working, which is the Amazon. Yes. And now you start the education company and that starts working. Yes. What did you do in those two things that completely shifted and changed the game for you? And how did you discover this Amazon thing? Um, so, you know, the discovery thing, I um, actually a few years later, I realized that I went through this process that I now call the discovery phase. Uh, so it's technically like five, three to five steps, depending on kind of where you are. And, and anyone watching, if you want to start an online business, if you want to start a business in general and don't know where to start, I would say start there because that's how I started. So first, grab a platform that you can research a bunch, a bunch of things on. For me, you know, choice was YouTube. YouTube is still available right now. Go on there and spend 30 days and research everything there is for you to say, make money online, make money from home, right? And just literally spend as much time as you can researching everything that's there. Step number three would be pick the top three things that interest you the most and drop everything else and just focus on those three for the next 30 days. Step number four is drop two and keep the one that you resonate with the most, mm -hmm. but then find three different people mentors, potential mentors that you can learn from. Step number five, 30 days later, this is about a two to three month process. Yeah, yeah. Drop two people and just keep one person that you feel like, okay, this is the right concept. This is the right business. This is the right mentor that I can learn from. And then a bonus step, do nothing else for the next two years, minimum. If you're not willing to invest at least two years, don't do it. Yeah. And ask yourself, am I willing to invest the next two years into this thing? Answer must be yes. Ask the second question, if after two years, it doesn't go nowhere because there's a big chance that it won't, won't go anywhere. If it goes nowhere, will I regret the last two years? And the answer has to be no, I will not regret the last two years. And if the answer is yes, then a no, then you know you have found the right thing. And just literally focus on that person, focus on that thing for the next two years. And that's essentially what I did when I found Amazon. Hmm. Okay. And then you... How, how do you start? Because Amazon, you need money to buy inventory and sure. all this other stuff. How do you start and how can people that are like, hey, I hate my nine to five or I don't like it. My restaurant burned down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I tried the dispensary thing and got raided. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How do you go from that to starting and like getting the, the capital to start a business and, and grow it? So first of all, I didn't start with private label, which is what I do right now, which requires about at least 10 to 20K. I did what I uh, what is called uh, retail arbitrage. So I would drive around to different stores, buy products, ship it to Amazon, sell it, and so on. My first sale was forty two ninety nine. I made like twelve thirteen dollar profit on that. I was off. I mean, dude, I, I couldn't even believe my eyes. Woke up with a sale. I'm like, holy shit! How is it even possible? That's when I was hooked. But then I quickly realized it wasn't scalable because I had to be driving around and stuff like that. And fortunately, a lot of people, especially people watching right now, they allow their bank account to hold them back. And what I mean by that is, I get this all the time. I only have $1,000, how can I start? I'm broke, I don't have money, how can I start? This thing requires $20,000, but I only have three. I only make $2,000 a month, how can I? I'm like, dude, there is $334 trillion in circulation at any given moment. And there is 8 billion people on planet Earth. I was $150,000 in debt, but I was able to raise $15,000 to start my Amazon business. How did I do that? There's a simple concept called OPM that literally every single Fortune 500 company in the world has done. Why do you think the stock market exists? Why do you think credit card invests? You know, how do you... How do you buy a house? You don't go and put cash on a house, a million dollar house, you're gonna put 10, 20, 30%. Where's that all mothering coming from? It's OPM. Yeah. The thing what people don't realize is we've been utilizing OPM all of our lives, just the wrong way. We've been taking credit cards from the bank, taking the bank's money, it's not your money. Credit card's not your money. It's a bank's money. They're, they're lending you that money. And we go on vacations and we go and shop and we go to restaurants. That's the wrong way of using OPM. Instead, take that money, go start a business with it. Go buy a course, you know? And that's essentially what I did. And that's how anyone, literally, if you're 18 years old, can put a couple words together, I bet you that you can start any business you want, doesn't matter how much it requires, in the next 30 days. You don't even need to have a penny in the bank. You can start it with just following these steps, you know? So you 
basically you're like okay listen don't use even your own capital even if you have zero in the bank you raise money capital use credit and start amazon what would you say are the three steps or a couple <clears throat> steps that you need to do in order to grow an amazon business to ten thousand dollars a month find someone who's done it before you who knows exactly what they're doing number two you need capital if you don't have it no problem don't let that stop you Find one or two people that are willing to invest ten, twenty thousand dollars into your business. Give them a cut. Give them ten, twenty, thirty, fifty percent of your business. Number three, get started. It's literally that easy. A lot of people will wait for the perfect conditions. Those don't exist. A lot of people will wait to make ten thousand dollars to go invest it. Look, how long has it taken you to make the last ten thousand dollars you had? Maybe never. Well, what makes you think that it's going to take you any shorter to, to make this happen? You need to, you know, understand that the only limitation you have is your imagination. If you can imagine it, you can make it happen. And instead, you know, every, a lot of people have done it. I know you've done it. I've done it. And anyone watching right now can do it as well, as long as they don't let their bank account or their mother-in-law or their sister or whoever else, you know, stop them or, or talk them out of doing whatever it is that they're trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I realized this myself. I mean, you don't know my, I don't think you know my story, but I went from having a million dollar business in 2018 at 25 years old to losing everything. And a year later, after that point, working as a cashier in a gas station here in Miami. That's all crazy. And then, yeah, and then building from that took a long, like it took me a year and a half to get out of that situation and then rebuild back up. Um, and what I realized is exactly that. It's your own mind plays limitations and your environment dictates a lot of what you think is real. Yes. If you're surrounded with people that say, oh, starting a business is risky. Oh, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do this. You should go to college. Like your reality will be shaped around that, even though it might not be your own thoughts. It's what you believe simply because of the people that surround yourself. Yes. So you are like, OK, these are the steps to make ten thousand dollars a month. How do you go from that to where you have your Amazon business today? Like the Amazon investing business, which you said is two fifty a month, right? Yeah. So after that, you have to understand that it's not about you anymore and it's about leverage. And the first leverage that you need to think about is leveraging other people. Um, because you probably got to here by leveraging other people's money. Now it's about leveraging other people's talents, leveraging other people's time, leveraging other people's you know, uh, attention. Uh, and you've probably used that as well because you found a mentor. You leverage someone else's knowledge. And I think that's, uh, you know, having leverage, it's, it's, it's the one thing that is very underrated and I don't think a lot of people think about or, or, or maybe don't know how to think about. And unfortunately, that's due to, to you know, the school system, due to, to social media, due to all the influences that we have around us. But going from zero to six figures is technically you working your face off seven days a week, doing whatever you need with some capital. Going from six to seven figures, that's where you need to understand that you need people with you and all of you together, you work your face off seven days a week and maybe some additional capital. And then going from you know uh, seven, eight figures, which I don't know if, if many in the audience are there, that's where you really have to understand that it's not about you working your face off anymore. You're more of just strategically thinking and strategically hiring the right people, putting them in the right places that figure out the, the right hows, the right strategy. There's a framework that I like to follow. What, who, how, what, who, how. First, you gotta figure out the what, which is the constraint, the problem you're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. And ask yourself, is it the right problem to solve right now? Is it the number one priority? Is it the one that's gonna give me the, 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 the max leverage, the max result? And then you gotta figure out the who. Am I the person or do I need to go hire someone? Do I need to go and hire someone doesn't all, always mean hire them as a team member. Yeah. Maybe it's a mentor, maybe it's a consultant, maybe it's mm -hmm. a whatever, you know? And then you let that person figure out the how or show you the how. Unfortunately, a lot of times we go from figuring out the what, jumping into the how immediately. And that's yeah. what I did for the first seven businesses, which is why they failed, was I found the what, and then I went into, okay, let me figure it out right now. And I jumped over the who, which is the most important thing. I like that a lot because a lot of times, even myself, it's I've, I struggle hiring. That's like one of the things that's like a completely different skill set than how you got the business to where it is right now in the first place. Yep. Because it was through grit or yep. grit versus you delegating it to somebody else and just letting the other person make it happen. Correct. So um, what is next for Bashar in 2024? What is what does the future look like? What are your next projects and where do you see yourself in the next three to five years? So we have a uh, we have a, a five year target. We want to get BJK University to have a five hundred million dollar valuation. Um, and to do that, we want to. So right now, uh, BJK University is it provides skills to everyday person that wants to have a better life 
they can turn into income within 90 days or less. Right now, that skill is Amazon FBA because I was an Amazon seller. Mm -hmm. I started teaching people how to sell on Amazon. Starting next year and over the next three to five years, we're going to start introducing other skills. I don't know what those are because that's where research is going to have to go in. But by 2028, we want to have at least 10 to 12 different skills that we provide our, our audience. Um, and through that, they can, you know, someone can come in. It's like going to school, going to college. You don't just go and become an engineer or, or this thing or that thing. They offer you different variety of things that yeah. you could be interested in to improve your life. So that's pretty much our, our five year vision and where we want to go. Got it. And how do you think you're going to get to the 500 million over the next five years? You know, it's a lot easier than a lot of people think. You don't necessarily need to generate 500 million for you to, to be worth 500 million. It's uh, the math is 150 million a year at 40 percent profit. That's kind of like to break it down. Yep. Um, but that's where the other skills come in because then we're, we're going to be able to attract a wider audience than we are right now. Because not everyone, you know, almost everyone on planet Earth wants a better life. I don't think there's anyone that doesn't, mm -hmm. right? But not everyone wants to become an Amazon seller. Maybe they don't like Jeff Bezos. Maybe they don't like dealing with China. Maybe they whatever, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so by providing people different options that they can choose from, so that way we don't become, you know, we're not a either BJK University or, or this place. It's more, what do I choose from BJK University? I've got nine different options. It's like, you know, one of them will work for me. Um, so that's essentially how we plan on uh, reaching that. Got it. And do you think Amazon still today is a great business model <clears throat> to launch, start and scale and make money online with? Short answer is absolutely. Uh, some stats, I like stats. 56% of all online sales happen on Amazon today. By the year 2040, 98, 98 percent of all purchases in the world will happen online. If 56% of all online purchases happen on Amazon today, if in, in the next decade and a half, 98 purchases, 98 percent of all purchases will happen online, that means in about a decade and a half, over half of the purchases in the world will happen on Amazon. And if you look at their trajectory or their their kind of their 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 the last 10 15 years, they have grown by 10 to 35% year over year. Third party seller pot of that continues to grow because Amazon is a shopping mall and not the, you know, the shop itself. They create a destination, they bring customers, and they make it convenient for the customers to shop. And then they have, you know, you and I and everyone else and every, you know, mm -hmm. people watching go and open up shop so that way we can kind of take piece of that pie, you know? I love that. I love that. So let's wrap it up here. Um, where can people find more <laughs> about you? Where can people find more about BJK University and where sure. people can get started on their Amazon journey if they're like, hey, listen, I want to become an Amazon investor like Bashar. Yes. I want to start making money online. I want to start building or I want to have this piece of the pie of this online shopping mall that Amazon is. Obviously, you can start with YouTube. You know, uh, if you want more stuff from me, um, we've actually made a page for special for this. If you just go to bjkpodcast.com, that's bjkpodcast.com. There's a bunch of stuff in there, a uh, bunch of free resources that you guys can uh, have. You know, you can follow me on social media from there. But uh, that's where they can find more. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I know you're super crazy busy. We, we have been like, what's funny is like, we actually have been planning this for like a month and a half, I think yes, it is. Yes. And like, we haven't been able to coordinate. I've been traveling, you've been traveling, like, you've been busy. Your congratulations in advance for uh, the anniversary next week. Oh, thanks, man. Um, but I appreciate you taking the time to be here. Yes. Um, the success that you've had in a very short amount of time is impressive. Um, in our space, we have seen it. And I'm looking forward to seeing how much bigger you can take this. It's Thanks, exciting. Man. Appreciate that. Thank you for having me. For sure. So if this is the first time for you watching this podcast and this episode, check out the links down below, subscribe and check out this guy because what you got is pretty freaking amazing. Peace out. See you in the next one.